Lindy Gao is a graduate student in the lab, and he'll be describing the engineered Cas9 variants that he's helped develop. Okay, great. Uh, so as Saurav discussed, one of the important issues to consider for a subset of genome editing applications is targeting specificity. Um, so for things like moving into the clinic, uh, it's important to, to make sure that off-target effects of editing are minimized as much as possible. And I'd like to summarize um, some techniques, including some work that we've been involved in, um, to try to ad help address that problem. Um, so here are some current strategies at risk of uh, not being ex exclusive, but uh, some, some major strategies for improving the specificity of uh, creating double-stranded breaks in the genome. And I've sort of separated this into two lists. One is the strategies that only involve using a single guide to create a double-stranded break with just Cas9. Um, so several very successful strategies that have been uh, pioneered by um, many people, including uh, those in the Boston area, including uh, truncated or intentionally mismatched guides. So if you take your sgRNA and shorten it by two or three nucleotides, or if you build in some mismatches toward the end of the guide uh, intentionally, that can actually have a very large effect in decreasing a lot of off-target off effects. Um, more recently, um, our group, as well as uh, uh, Dr. Keith Jung's group at MGH, have developed high-specificity Cas9 variants. Um, these uh, are basically mutated uh, versions of Cas9 with alanine substitutions at some key polar and hydrophilic residues um, that, that have a very large effect on, on reducing off-target activity. Um, and two other general things that, that have a, a, a big influence are target site selection, so picking guides that are actually really specific um, and have very few uh, off-targets that have a few number of mismatches, and trying to reduce the exposure of the genome to Cas9, for example, by transient delivery of, of ribonuclear protein complex instead of sustained expression. Um, I should point out that the first two strategies here, um, truncating or uh, intentionally mismatched guides and high-specificity Cas9 variants, are generally mutually exclusive, so you don't want to combine these two. So it's an either you use the Cas9 variants or uh, truncated or mismatched guides, but, but not both. Um, so the second set of strategies is uh, using two guides at the same time to target one genetic locus. Um, for example, by using uh, paired nickases or by fusion proteins with Cas9 and uh, other uh, nonspecific nucleus domains uh, to get dimerization. Um, so what I want to focus on today is specifically uh, these two of using high specificity Cas9 variants along with um, optimal target site selection as a very straightforward means to improve genome editing specificity without major modifications to existing workflows. Um, so there's two high specificity, specificity variants that are, that are available. Uh, one that our group developed called ESP Cas9. It's available on AdGene. And another one um, uh, developed by Dr. Keith Jung's group called SPCAS9 uh, HF1. So I'll talk um, uh, a little bit about our work uh, in engineering SP ESPCAS9 and some guide principles uh, for designing guides uh, for ESPCAS9 today. The basic idea was how can we better equip Cas9 to distinguish between on-target and off-target sites? Um, and one strategy that could be used by observing the crystal structure was that the non-target DNA strand, so the one that gets displaced as the sgRNA invades the target DNA, is sequestered in a positively charged cleft situated between the HNH uh, RUV-C nucleus domains as well as the PAM interacting domain. And the hypothesis that we had was if we somehow attenuate those positive charges so it can less, uh, so it has less interaction with the, the phosphate uh, backbone of the displaced strand, we could bias um, cleavage activity to only targets that have perfect matches and reject targets that have some number of mismatches. Um, when we looked at mutations in this cleft, um, so here is showing indel percentages at the gray bar, which is the on-target site, and blue bars, which are known off-target sites. So for this particular guide sequence, the wild-type cast line actually has very significant off-target activity. But some of the uh, alanine mutations in the cleft that I mentioned, um, including, for example, um, 780, uh, 810, 848, 855, actually, in this assay that we used, next generation sequencing, completely abolished activity at all three off-target sites. Um, so this was a very promising start. Um, we tested these mutations at a different uh, target site, and we saw uh, actually a, a, a lower but detectable level of off-target activity. But anyways, um, after um, doing some optimization on it, we finally came up with 
uh, two variants, which we called ESP Cas9, consisting of three alanine mutants along the cleft. Um, by characterizing these, we found that they have very similar on target efficiencies uh, to wild type Cas9. So every dot here is a different guide, and a value of 1.0 means it has the same efficiency as wild type. So most of the guides cluster right around one. I think the mean is about 0.95 here. Um, uh, and to further characterize how much of a, of a target discrimination this gives us, um, so here is wild type Cas9 um, targeting the first, uh, he, the guide is the on-target guide at a VEGFA um, human gene. And the remainder are mismatch guides with consecutive mismatches tiled along the sequence of the guide. So ideally, we would want this bar to be really high and all these to be very low. But Cas9 by itself actually has, for this guide, very significant off-target activity in the, in the back half of the guide. Um, when we do a comparison with wild-type Cas9 to some of the mutants, we see a pretty significant effect where uh, most of the off-targets uh, go away. Um, so a general uh, sort of rule of thumb for how to design guides for, for ESP Cas9, um, and probably applicable as well uh, to SP Cas9 HF1, is um, picking guides that, that, that don't have mismatches. So because these enzymes were created to reject mismatches, it's not good to even have a mismatch at the very beginning of the guide. Um, so you wanna try to choose guides that actually already start with a G in the genome and not try to uh, change the five prime base to a G when it's not already a G because that will negatively impact targeting efficiency. Um, the other thing is, uh, I think it can also be a way to, to, to simplify target site selection. So generally, um, I think if there is, if you have a target where all the predicted off-target sites have at least three mismatches uh, relative to the on-target site, um, then regardless of the scoring, um, it can generally be pretty confident that there's gonna be minimal off-target activity for that particular guide. Um, so lastly, I wanna talk about um, some more recent work we've been doing with CRISPR-CPF1, which as Srav discussed, is an alternative genome editing system. Um, so of the natural diversity of, of class two CRISPR systems, um, CPF1 is actually a, a totally different um, sort of nuclease system um, that our, our lab recently developed um, for genome editing and has been um, characterized by, by many groups. Uh, so CPF1 has some notable advantages uh, and differences compared to Cas9. These include creating staggered cuts that are distal to the PAM uh, ra rather than blunt end cuts, um, requiring only a, a CRISPR RNA and no tracer RNA, so a much shorter RNA requirement. Um, and this is maybe very significant, which is it allows very easy multiplex genome editing by delivering a single CRISPR RNA array rather than many guides driven by an individual promoter. One of the drawbacks with using CPF1 is that uh, it has a more restrictive PAM requirement um, with three Ts and then the fourth base that's not a T, um, which can sort of restrict the number of target sites that could be targeted with this system. Um, so more recently, we've been um, trying to uh, like engineer CPF1 to recognize alternative kinds of PAM sequences to improve its targeting range. Um, so for here example, we show that by introducing two mutations of arginine, uh, in the PAM interacting domain of CPF1, uh, we can boost activity um, significantly at these uh, target sites with, with um, cytosine containing PAMs. Um, and similarly, if we choose, uh, introduce some alternative mutations, we can boost editing efficiency at um, PAMs where the second position is changed from a T to an A. So overall, these uh, variants in, improve targeting efficiency about threefold in, in human coding sequences. Um, so doing an in vitro cleavage assay, we can profile the, the PAM activity and it's uh, fairly consistent um, with what we saw uh, with measuring indel rates. Um, so these will be available on AdGene soon. Uh, their number is uh, 89, 351, 352 uh, through 355. Um, and it should be on, on there within, within a couple of weeks. Um, so I'd like to thank everyone in the Zhang Lab and uh, thank you all for listening to this talk.